Hi, so this is your second uh, lecture that goes along with chapter four in biology 2E, and we're going to talk about cells, a topic that I think is pretty straightforward and a lot of you are already familiar with. So see how you do on the pretest questions. The basic unit of life and the smallest unit that has all the properties of life is, that's right, it's the cell. Okay, prokaryotic cells. That might be a term some of you are not familiar with. Lack which of these things? Okay, they lack a nucleus. A nucleus is a membrane that encloses the DNA and prokaryotic cells have no membrane enclosed organelles. They have no structures internally that are enclosed by a membrane. Number three, most cells are small because, okay, so A is a true statement, B is a true statement, so the correct answer is C, that both A and B are true. So the fundamental unit of life is a cell. Cells are the building blocks of all organisms. In single cell organisms, one cell is the organism, and cells only arise from other cells. Here are three slides of cells, two taken with a light microscope, one of the nasal cavity of an animal, one of plant onion cells, and you can see the nucleus inside, and one showing bacteria, and that looks like a uh, eukaryotic macrophage spearing the bacteria. And this was taken with an electron microscope. Uh, we talked about uh, going from simpler to more complex. And so if we start at cells, cells get put together to form tissues. Tissues form together to form organs. Organs form together to form organ systems. And finally, in a multicellular animal, those organ systems form an organism. So even though cells are different sizes, for the most part, they're too small to be seen with the naked eye. A light microscope uh, can magnify things about 400 times, and you're sending the light through the, a thin sample through a magnifying lens, and it's being bent up to your eye. With electron microscopes, you can increase the power uh, tremendously, and you're using a beam of electrons. Since electrons are much smaller particles, it's like you've made the pixel size significantly smaller with electron microscopes. And the electrons are focused with um, um, magnetically. They're, fo they're focused with magnets and somehow the image is displayed on some sort of display screen. So here's a butterfly, it's half its normal size. Here's a butterfly, a picture is taking its normal size. And now here's a butterfly taking five times its normal size. That's what we'll do mostly. We'll make things larger than their normal size. Uh, light microscopes sometimes use dyes to help enhance the color. So here's a cell, these look like uh, cheek cells and they've been stained with different stains. And you can see the nucleus inside, which is where the DNA is held. Uh, this was probably stained using methylene blue. Again, you can see the nucleus inside and that's where the DNA is found. So using a beam of electrons, you can see things a thousand times greater with an electron microscope than a light microscope. There are two kinds of electron microscopes, scanning electron microscopes, which give you this flatter kind of image where you're looking right through the object. In this case, you're looking through a mitochondria, which is a membrane bound organelle found within cells. And down here, you're looking at red blood cells, and this is called a scanning electron micrograph. A scanning electron micrograph gives a 3D image by bouncing electro electrons off the outside of the object. Sometimes you'll see these electron micrographs 
with different colors, but they're always made in black and white. And then the colorization is an artist adding color to it later. Uh, here's a figure, and I believe it's the same figure, but don't quote me on that. But here's a light microscope, and the little dots all around here are salmonella bacteria. And I believe these larger ones are uh, human cells. And then the same scene over here, these larger things represent the human cells, and these small red things represent the E. coli bacteria. So you can kind of see the difference you get between a light microscope and an electron microscope. Sometimes we take the basic tenets of, of what we know about cells and we put them together and we say, this is the, the theory of the cell, that cells are the basic units of life. It seems simple to us, but for many years, people had microscopes and looked at cells starting in the 1800s, but yet they didn't realize that what they were looking at were the basic units of life. And so all organisms are made up of cells. If you're a single-celled organism, then one cell is the organism. If you're a multi-celled organism, uh, humans are made of trillions of cells. And cells only come from cells. Uh, scientists believe that all life is related and all life arose from one original cell. There's some speculation about how that original cell arose, but today we know that life doesn't come from non-life, that any cells come from cells that already exist. Okay, when we talk about prokaryotic cells, it's a word for both the domain archaea and the domain bacteria. Until the 1970s, we considered them all bacteria, and it wasn't until Carl Woos did chemical analysis to show that some of these single-celled organisms were so different than these other cells that they were really a unique cell type. Uh, when we talk about prokaryotes, we'll mainly be referring to the bacteria. We won't talk much in this course about the archaea. All prokaryotes lack membrane-enclosed internal compartments called organelles. They have no nucleus, they have no ER, all these different things that we'll see that are part of the eukaryotic cell uh, aren't found in prokaryotes. There's a cell wall outside of the cell, there's a plasma membrane inside the cell wall, all cells have plasma membranes. Uh, prokaryotics are like the first cells on Earth and they still exist today. When eukaryotic cells arose, prokaryotes, pro prokaryotes didn't disappear, and the organisms in, that are prokaryotes could be in the domain archaea, or they could be in the domain bacteria. So here's a typical bacteria, and they're showing there's DNA. It's in the middle, and people will tell you it's in the nucleoid region. It's not surrounded by a membrane called the nucleus, called the nuclear membrane. Okay, around the outside of the cell is the cell me membrane or the plasma membrane. Okay, some, sometimes people call it the cell membrane, sometimes people call it the plasma membrane. And external to the cell membrane is a rigid structure called the cell wall. Okay. By being smaller, that gives you more surface area relative to volume. Think about feeding people for Thanksgiving if they were inside of the arena where the uh, Phoenix Suns played, Talking Stick Arena. Think of how far you'd have to go to get turkey dinners to everybody in all the seats of the arena. Okay, Now divide the same 25,000 people, but put them in a trailer park up in, I don't know, where, where would it be nice to have a trailer park? Maybe on the outskirts of Sedona, where the Red Rocks are. Okay, same 25,000 people in a big field and trailers. Think about what you'd have to do to get the food to the different people. In the people in the Suns Arena, you'd have to schlep all that food all the way into everybody at all the seats and then 
get all the garbage back to the outside. With the uh, trailer park, you just drive down the rows, throw the food in the windows, and get them to throw the garbage bag out. So uh, by having a smaller size, the internal volume is always closer to the outside, and it's a way for cells to adequately get enough nutrients and adequately get rid of their waste products. So uh, this is showing the relative size of different things. Okay, so here's a person at one meter, and then we're going down um, by, by uh, 10 times. So from one meter, 100 millimeter would be an egg. The biggest cell uh, in the world is an ostrich egg. Even a chicken egg, you can see with your naked eye. Okay, and then going down 100 times from the ostrich egg would be a frog egg. Uh, going down 10 times from that is a human egg. So even in humans, the egg is the biggest cell. And the reason why egg cells are so large is because they're hanging on to a lot of cytoplasm to nourish the growing uh, embryo, the fertilized egg. Okay, a plant cell and a human cell are about uh, 10 micrometers. And then going down 10 times more, you would see bacteria cells. So bacterial cells are 10 times smaller than eukaryotic cells. Uh, subcellular structures called organelles within the animal and plant cells are the same size as bacteria, about one micrometer. Going down 10 times smaller still, you'd get viruses. 10 times smaller still, proteins. Uh, 10 times smaller still, um, phospholipids. We'll talk about those when we talk about membranes. And then 10 times smaller still, you're down to the level of the atom. Okay, so the light microscope can see down to bacteria size. And then the electron microscope can see a thousand times smaller, so even to the level of uh, proteins and atoms. So what's limiting cell size? What we just talked about, as cells get bigger, the volume increases faster than the surface area. And so you can't bring in enough nutrients or get rid of enough waste products to supply the cell with what it needs. So at a certain size, the cell just can't feed itself. Here's a eukaryotic animal cell. So there are a lot of eukaryotic single cells, celled organisms, and we'll focus this semester mostly on eukary eukaryotic cells and on um, multi-celled eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cell type is a type of cell found in animals, plants, fungi, the three multicellular kingdoms we see on a daily basis, as well as uh, things that are single-celled eukaryotes like amoebas and euglena and a lot of things that you're less familiar with. You can see one of the features of eukaryotic cells is being about 10 times larger than prokaryotic cells. And the reason why they can be larger and still be able to supply themselves a lot, enough nutrients is because they have a lot of membranes internally and things are being shuttled in and out across the plasma membrane on the outside, but things are also being shuttled in and out across the membrane bound structures on the inside. So by using energy and having pumps, you can move things around internally. Things aren't just drifting around internally the way they are in a prokaryotic cell. Okay, so we'll go through a lot of these organelles and a lot of these cell parts in this. So one of the big difference between the domain eukarya and the domain bacteria and archaea is that eukaryotic cells have organelles or membrane bound compartments inside that have specialized features. So just like in your house, it's not a one room schoolhouse like a trailer. The trailer just has everything thrown inside uh, maybe there's uh, walls for the bathroom, but instead in your house, there's a kitchen. That's where you cook. There's a bedroom. That's where you sleep. There's a den. That's where you study. And cells are like that. They have these compartments that are specialized and they're surrounded by membranes. And we call these organelles. Some of the names would be nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and a lot more. And we're going to go through 
through these organelles in today's lecture. Okay, what bounds the cell? What separates the inside and outside of the cell? And the answer for prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells is the same. They're both separated from outside of the cell by the plasma membrane. You know, we said prokaryotes all have cell walls. Cell walls are considered to be outside of the cell or outside of the plasma membranes. Uh, some eukaryotic cells have cell walls. Plant cells have cell walls. Fungi have cell walls, but animals don't have cell walls. Okay. All right. Does it contain membrane-bound structures? How about prokaryotes? How about eukaryotes? Okay, which is larger, which is smaller? Okay. Okay, everybody knows that prokaryotic cells are single-celled, okay, but people sometimes get eukaryotic cells wrong. Eukaryotic cells are both single and multi-celled. Okay, where would you put a bacteria? Where would you put a plant? Where would you put an animal cell? All right, so the plasma membrane is the structure that separates what's inside of the cell and what's outside of the cell. It is made of a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins. Uh, a phospholipid is like a little oil droplet. So if you made it into a circle, a cell would be a little oil droplet. And the oil, remember oil and water don't mix, the little oil droplet prevents things from moving in and out. If the oil droplet prevents things from moving in and out, how do they get into the cell? There are proteins that actually cross all the way across the oil droplet. And a lot of these proteins have different functions, but some act as protein channels. They act as tunnels to let different substances cross from the inside or outside of the cell. And those tunnels are regulated. So just like you might have a toll bridge or a toll tunnel where you'd have to stop and uh, they might let you across or they might not, okay, that's how these protein channels work. Uh, something like the red blood cell has 40 different kinds of embedded proteins. So there are many, many different kinds of embedded proteins. And we'll talk about membranes and their embedded proteins in a little bit. Uh, when we talk about the cell, we'll often talk about the cytoplasm. So if I draw a cell, that's supposed to be round. And I draw the nucleus. Okay, so you have the plasma membrane, the nucleus. And the cytoplasm is the area outside of the nucleus, but inside the plasma membrane. And it includes all the organelles. It will just put the word cyto, except for the nucleus. All right. okay, the cytoplasm um, is uh, mostly water, but it has a semi-solid gel-like consistency due to the proteins embedded in it. So we'll often talk about these terms, and you really have to know them cold. So here's the nucleus where the DNA is. Here's the plasma membrane, which is the barrier between the inside and outside of the cell. And this is the cytoplasm, the area outside of the nucleus, but inside of the plasma membrane. Uh, some of these organelles will have multiple numbers of them, but for the nucleus, uh, in general, there's only one per cell. It's the largest organelle in animal cells, and there's a nuclear envelope around the nucleus. Within the nucleus, there's a nucleolus, or a nucleolus, I think it's pronounced, and the nucleolus is where ribosomes are made, and the material in the nucleus is DNA wrapped around protein, and so we'll focus on the DNA, but when they talk about DNA wrapped around protein, they'll call it chromatin. And different molecules will move in or out of the nucleus across the nuclear envelope. 
and there are nuclear pores that allow this to happen. Uh, the nuclear envelope is a double membrane that separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm. You can see that there's a nuclear pore complex that allows things to move across the nucleus and regulate flows of molecules back and forth. Uh, later on, we talk about how DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. We'll find out that RNA gets made in the nucleus and moves out through the nuclear pore into the cytoplasm. Uh, the nucleolus is a region in the middle, and that's where ribosomes are made and assembled. Uh, ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis, so they move out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore. They're assembled out here, and they're going to be in the cytoplasm, helping cells to synthesize proteins. So here's a ribosome. It's made of two subunits, and the two subunits come together around a piece of mRNA, and they build a protein, one amino acid at a time. Now, you don't have to know all these details now. We'll come back to all this later. But for now, you should, sit, you should know that all cells, whether they're eukaryotes or prokaryotes, all cells have ribosomes. They're all made of two subunits, and they're all the site or the place where protein synthesis happens. Uh, mitochondria. A lot of you know what mitochondria are. They're the powerhouse of the cell. When we're hungry, we eat food. When plants uh, need material and when they need energy, they build their own food. Uh, but both plants and animals take that food and they break it down and they make it into energy. And they do that in the powerhouse of the cell and the mitochondria. And the form of energy that cells use is a chemical form of energy called ATP. Peroxisomes. Uh, peroxisomes is an organelle that we sometimes skip over, but we're going to be doing a, a, a lab later in the semester with peroxisomes. So I thought I'd mention them now. Uh, they're a small organelle enclosed by a single membrane, and they do a couple things. They're involved in fatty acid metabolism. So if you're not eating and you want to break down fats, or sometimes in our diet, uh, we have essential fats that we need to break down. Uh, fatty acids get broken down within the peroxisome. And uh, in your liver, when we detoxify alcohol, those reactions happen in our peroxisome. And the reason why they're called the peroxisome is as part of the reaction, breaking things down, they use hydrogen peroxide. All right, animals and plant cells. Animal and plant cells are both eukaryotic cells. Most organelles are found in both animal and plant cells, but there are a few things that are unique to each of them. So animal cells have something called a centrosome, which is uh, something that arranges the microtubules and when animal cells divide, and plant cells don't have it. Um, animal cells have lysosomes as well, the organelle we just saw, and plant cells don't have lysosomes as well. Okay, but plant cells have some things animal cells don't have. They have a cell wall outside of the plasma membrane. They have chloroplasts that do photosynthesis, and they have a lot of other uh, plastids. Plastids or originate from the same precursor cells as chloroplasts, and a common plastid we'll see this semester is the amyloplast. It's where starch is stored in potatoes. And then they have a large central vacuole. The largest organelle in animal cells is the um, nucleus, but in plants, it's a central vacuole. That's the largest organelle. All right, so here's an animal cell, and it just shows you uh, the different organelles, and we'll go through these different organelles within the animal cell. Okay, you'll see the plant cell is also a eukaryotic cell, and it looks quite similar, uh, but it has a larger central vacuole, and it has these green chloroplasts. Okay. okay, so the reason why plant cells look so boxy is because you're looking at the cell wall, and the cell wall are these rigid structures on the outside of the plant, the cell walls are made of a material called cellulose, which is indigestible. So when 
People say, oh, eat plants. They have a lot of fiber. It's good for you. It's this indigestible cellulose in the cell wall that's in, that people are talking about. And it turns out that cellulose is the most abundant organic matter in the world. So it's a pretty important material. Um, if you're writing on paper, that's mainly uh, plant cell walls. It's, it's this uh, cell wall material. Um, we said that bacteria also have cell walls. It's made up of a slightly different material, so bacteria uh, don't have cellulose. So one organelle found in plants but not animals is called the chloroplast. Chloroplast has a green pigment chlorophyll inside of it. There are a double membrane structure on the outside and all these stacked membranes on the inside. And we'll go into more detail how they make their own food. But the process of making their own food is called photosynthesis. And why they're very different from us is we need to eat other living things whereas plants can build food from carbon dioxide and water. Uh, here's a central vacuole within a plant, and part of what it does is it helps in the water balance of a plant. It, animal cells want to have uh, a balance between the water inside the cell and outside the cell, whereas plants want uh, increasing amounts of water to be pulled in, into the cell and the cell membrane expands, so it's actually pressed up against the cell wall. Because they have these rigid cell walls on the outside, they actually want the uh, water to be pulled quite strongly into the cell. They want a more dilute solution outside. All right, so again, this is a slide where I'm asking you to do a comparison. Compare this structure or this process between bacteria, animal cells, plant cells. So I've done the first one for you. A plasma membrane would be found in a bacteria. It would be found in an animal cell. It would be found in a plant cell. How about a cell wall? Do bacteria have cell walls? Okay, the answer is yes. Yes, they do. Okay, how about in an animal cell? Do animal cells have cell walls? Nope, they do not have cell walls. Okay, how about plants? Do they have cell walls? Yes, but the cell walls of animals and plants are a slightly different material. Okay, go back. Let's do the nucleus. Do bacteria cells have a nucleus? Well, bacteria have a nucleoid region, but they have, they have no membrane-bound compartments. So, nope, they don't have a nucleus. And both animal cells and plant cells are eukaryotic cells. So, yeah. Yes, so we get the Y a little better, and yes again. Okay, ER membrane, again, nope, bacteria cells don't have any organelles, so there's no ER membrane. Okay, animal cells, yep, and we'll talk about what ER membrane does a bit, and plant cells, yep. They have ER membrane. Okay, DNA. Even though there's no nucleus, is there DNA in bacterial cells? Sure, all cells have to have DNA. And so, yes for animals, yes for plants. Okay, photosynthesis is a process, it's not a structure. Do bacterial cells do photosynthesis? Well, since for a billion years all there were were bacteria and uh, archaea, photosynthesis originated before there were eukaryotic cells. So the answer is there were bacteria that did photosynthesis, and there still are some bacteria that do photosynthesis. So some do. Okay, do animal cells do photosynthesis? Clearly not. And plant cells? Yeah, generally when we think of plants, we think, yeah, they do photosynthesis and animals don't. Okay, cell respiration is what happens in the mitochondria to make the ATP. We often think of cell respiration as breathing, but even single cell organisms can do cell respiration. So, oh, bacteria can be single cell organisms. And 
they mostly do uh, cell respiration, although some bacteria can live without oxygen. Okay, animal cells, yes, they have mitochondria and do cell respiration. And people kind of forget, because when they think of plants, they think of photosynthesis, but plants also have mitochondria and they also do cell respiration. So um, a lot of what makes cells change from generation to generation are changes within the DNA. But once in a while, a change comes about through a symbiotic relationship. And if you go down and look sometime at a coral reef, uh, you'll see that the coral are animals, but they're brightly colored. They're oranges and reds and greens. And the corals, which are animals, have algae living inside of them. And they're in what's called a symbiosis. They give the algae a place to live and return. The algae gives them food. It does photosynthesis. Well, we're also in a symbiotic relationship. We're in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. So we have bacteria living on us and in us. You'll have a chance to explore that later in the course. And they're not um, harmful, and many of them are actually beneficial. We tend to focus on the pathogenic bacteria, but it's just a normal part of our uh, being human to have bacteria living in us and on us. So these intimate relationships are called symbioses. And endosymbiosis means an inside symbiosis. And so uh, the theory goes, or the, the evidence explains that uh, an ancestral cell of today's eukaryotes swallowed up another cell. Why would it swallow up a, another cell, a bacterial cell? Because it was what's for dinner. But instead of digesting it, it enslaved it. And that original bacteria became what today is a mitochondria. Sometime later, that cell with the mitochondria swallowed up a cell with a that did photosynthesis. And that prokaryotic cell, that bacterial cell that did photosynthesis became a chloroplast. So mitochondria and chloroplast were once free living bacteria that were swallowed and enslaved by another cell. And unlike certain uh, traits and certain things that happened that happened many times in evolutionary history, like the pocket mouse, where different kinds of pocket mouse had different mutations, which led to them having dark skin color. Uh, we think that the enslavement of mitochondria only happened one time in evolutionary history. So all cells with mitochondria are related, and the same thing with chloroplast, that that only happened one time in evolutionary history. And so all organisms that have chloroplasts are all related to one original cell that swallowed up a chloroplast. All right, go back at the last slide and go ahead and read it. Find two organelles that were once free living prokaryotes and give two pieces of evidence to support this idea. Eukaryotic cells are filled with membranes internally, and endo means inside, and membrane are these compartments inside. So the endomembrane system consists of the membranes inside the cells working together. What kind of things do they do? They can modify and package and transport both lipids and proteins. Parts of the endomembrane system are the nuclear envelope, the ER membrane, lysosomes, vesicles, Golgi apparatus, and the plasma membrane. So let's. The ER membrane is the endoplasmic reticulum. About half of all membrane inside of a cell is ER, ER membrane. I'll just call it ER. Some of the ER membrane is rough ER, and that modifies proteins, proteins usually to be exported. Usually the proteins are made inside the rough ER and then they'll be exported out of the cell. The smooth ER modifies lipids. So 
parts of the cell that process um, lipids have a lot of smooth ER, and in your liver, your liver has a lot of smooth ER involved in detoxification of alcohol. The smooth ER and the rough ER are continuous or connected to the nuclear membrane. So if this is a nuclear membrane, then the uh, ER is connected to that. In rough ER, you're making proteins to be exported. So there are ribosomes attached to the surface of the rough ER, and that's a site of protein synthesis. And then the proteins move inside of the rough ER. Uh, once you get proteins made in the RER, then they can be uh, incorporated as part of cell membranes, or oftentimes they're secreted from the cell. So things like insulin, which is a hormone, things like um, mucus, though they're all products that are made in the RER and then secreted or exported outside of the cell. So here's the RER, and so they're showing you there's ribosomes attached to the ER membrane. Uh, oftentimes when proteins get made inside the RER, a vesicle will pinch off with that protein inside of it. And then that little vesicle is a little oil droplet filled with the protein. It will merge with the Golgi apparatus and get modified further in, a, in the Golgi apparatus. All right, so here's the nucleus. Here's the RER with the ribosomes attached. And over here is the smooth ER. So smooth ER often processes and uh, makes lipids. It's not involved with proteins because uh, proteins are gonna be made on the ribosomes. It's attached and continuous with the rough ER, so it's attached to the rough ER, but it's not doing what the rough ER is doing. Uh, some of the things that might be made in the smooth ER, carbohydrates, lipids, uh, steroid hormones, uh, like I said before, your liver is full of smooth ER, detoxifying alcohol, storage of calcium. They're all possible functions of the smooth ER. Uh, lysosomes. Lysosomes are one of those organelles found in animal cells, but not plant cells. Uh, they contain digestive enzymes that break things down. Lys means to break, so they're breaking bodies. And so in this case, they're showing some sort of single cell organism that's breaking down food particles. Uh, in our body, they often will show lysosomes breaking down damaged organelles. So uh, if a mitochondria goes bad, it will merge with a uh, lysosome and it will digest the parts of the mitochondria. Uh, the Golgi apparatus is a labeling and sorting center so lipids or proteins uh, need to be sorted, packaged, and tagged. So oftentimes if a protein might be made in the rough ER, it's labeled with a carbohydrate in the Golgi apparatus, and then it's sent to the outside of the cell to be exported to go to the part of the, part of the organism where it functions. So a label and packaging center. So they used to say the... Uh, cell is full of cytosol and the organelles are just floating in the jelly-like matrix. But now we know the cell is filled with these protein rods. And these protein rods together are called the cell skeleton or the cytoskeleton. It's a network of protein rods. It gives the cell its shape. So cells can be different shapes. They might be long and skinny. They might be more square. They might be more round. And that shape is determined by these protein rods. Uh, organelles, like the nucleus, always seems to be in the middle because it's not just floating around freely, it's anchored in place by these protein rods. And finally, a lot of cells uh, have movement. They might have structures on the outside, like cilia or flagella that help them move, or they may have uh, microtubules inside. So when they divide, for example, the microtubules uh, push against each other to help them divide. 
So these are all part of these protein rods inside the cell called the cytoskeleton. And so they're showing all the cytoskeleton, all these rods inside the cell, and they'll separate them out because they're made of a different material. And they'll say, well, there are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. I won't ask you about the structure of each of these different kinds of components, but you should just realize they're all part of the cytoskeleton. So these are telling you what the different parts of the cytoskeleton do, that microfilaments are involved in movement and they're made from a protein called actin. Uh, microtubules are made of a protein called tubulin and they form the network that's holding and anchoring the uh, organelles in place and giving the cell its internal structure and sometimes those um, cables are the cables along which uh, structures can move, so they're like monorail tracks. Cilia and flagella are an organelle most people are familiar with. They're made of microtubules. They're outside of the cell. They're found in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, cilia are, are shorter and more numerous. So in our trachea, there are cilia waving to try and keep the uh, dirt out of our windpipe. And then um, uh, flagella, people think of sperm when they think of flagella. There are one long stru structure that's sort of beating and waving to move the sperm along. They're both involved in movements. Okay, outside of plant cells, you get a cell wall. It supports the plant cell. Uh, and then there are connections between different plant cells, and those connections are called plasmodesmata. Okay. Animal cells don't have cell walls, but we still have material outside of the cell that helps to support the cell and stick cells together. And that's called the extracellular matrix, and that's made of collagen and some other proteins, as well as uh, carbohydrates. So cells don't work independently in a multicellular organism. They work together. And so on the left, uh, they're showing uh, plant cells working together. And on the right, they're showing, I believe these are epidermal cells. So we're going to look at how cells work together by having intercellular junctions. OK, so here's a plant cell. and Here's one cell, here's a second cell, and they're connected through little tunnels called uh, plasmodesmata. And so the material can move actually between the cells very easily through these tunnels. So if these are two cells from the small intestine, you don't want the food you eat that's going through the small intestine to sneak in between the cells. You want the cells to break down that food and take up the nutrients across proteins into the cell. So these tight junctions weave the cells together and they prevent our food from slipping in between those two cells. So tight junctions are watertight seals and they're found in epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are like the skin on the outside and the lining inside of our organs. So in this case, the lining of the small intestine. These are rivet, riveting junctions or button-like junctions called desmosomes, and people compare them to like the snap on a gene. So they're not uh, watertight, but they're more rigid, and your book says, well, they're like spot welds, very strong welds in certain parts, and so they can join tissues that stretch like your heart and your lungs and your muscles. Uh, they're only found in animals. And then we have gap junctions, which is sort of equivalent to the plasmodesmata. So if you have two cells, one here and one here, material can pass right between them without having to go through the phospholipid bilayer by these junctions that join between them. And so the name kind of tells you what they are. They're gap junctions.